How to Achieve Freedom, Episode 6. Hello and welcome. My name is Dan Shielding, and this is the podcast where freedom lovers explore and solve one specific question. How can we achieve freedom? Here you can learn practical, effective strategies to achieve freedom for yourself, for your loved ones, and to establish a truly free society based on the non-aggression principle. So let's get going. After comparing Ruby Ridge, Waco, and the Bundy Ranch standoff, as well as a number of other historical events, it's become very clear to me, at least in my opinion, that any violence against federal agents is to be avoided like the plague. I'm not saying you should be defenseless. I'm not saying you should sacrifice your life for these aggressors. I'm just saying grave physical harm to government agents tends to result in innocent people getting killed. And in the vast majority of situations, it is counterproductive to the cause of freedom because government can use that act of violence to turn public opinion against us. So this presents a dilemma. If that's the case, how on earth can we defend ourselves and what should we do if government agents threaten our lives with physical force? This is part of a series in which I explore the three main events I mentioned, Ruby Ridge, Waco, and the Bundy Ranch standoff in order to learn lessons from that exploration. And this is the last episode in that series. I hope you enjoy it. At the end of this episode, I will be reviewing the lessons we've, uh, I've learned And I hope you find this information helpful. So, enjoy. Now, I'd like to talk about one specific point that I mentioned in the the beginning. And that is, we should not kill a federal agent. Like I said, that presents the dilemma. What do you do if a federal agent threatens the life of you or your loved ones? How do you defend yourself? if you cannot harm a federal agent. Well, number one, I still believe it is preferable for every mature individual to always conceal carry weapons. Why do I say carry weapons? Because it reduces violent crime. I don't care what gun control advocates say, that has been proven to be true. The more people who are concealed carrying weapons, the less rapes, murders, and assaults there are in a region. And it's very logical and simple to understand. If a violent criminal, private or public, wants to commit a crime, they want to commit a crime against defenseless victims. They don't want there to be more risk against them for committing that crime. And when people are armed, there's more risk to the violent criminal. So they might as well go somewhere else where victims are defenseless. Now, why do I say always carry? Because you never know when violent criminals will strike. And I'm not trying to make people paranoid. I'm fully aware that in any specific moment, the chances that you will be targeted by a violent criminal are very slim. However, violent crimes do happen. And when they do, the things and relationships and people that are more most precious to you are in jeopardy. Your loved ones can be tortured and murdered. That is in itself, even though the the chances are small, that's a good enough reason for me to always be prepared to defend them. And you never know when when violence can strike. It can happen when you're sleeping in bed at night. It can happen when you're taking a shower, when you're walking to your car, when you're going in your house, when you're at a movie. We've seen examples of crimes, horrible crimes, beginning in all these situations. So, always be prepared. Why do I say concealed? Well, this is a hotly debated issue. I'm I'm sure there's some out there that would disagree with me, but my own personal preference is that people should always conceal carry because the whole point of carrying a weapon is to provide risk to violent criminals, to make violent crime risky. So if people, as a general trend, if the norm is open carry, then 
criminal, violent criminals can still avoid risk. They can see who's armed and who's not. They can avoid people who are armed and target defenseless victims when they're alone. There is no more risk to those violent criminals in that situation. A violent criminal can also walk up behind an open carrying, open carry person, victim, shoot him in the back of the head, and then carry out a crime on the rest of the defenseless victims in the area. That happened at a bank. I'm sure that's happened more than once. Open carrying puts a target on your back, and it makes you more likely to die when a violent criminal strikes. And it does not present any more risk to the violent criminal because he can ambush you. So that's why I prefer concealed. Now, let's talk about using defensive lethal force against government agents. From an ethical perspective, one could make the argument that it's justified based on the non-aggression principle. Using lethal force to defend yourself against lethal force that's initiated against you or your loved ones can be argued as justified. Now, from a practical perspective, it's not justified. It's the worst thing that could happen to you. Your loved ones are vastly more likely to die as a result. And I'll make the point that it does not matter who fired first. There was a lot of people, not a lot of people, sorry. There, I did hear some people at Bundy Ranch that said, we're not going to be the ones that fire first. If anyone's going to fire first, it's going to be the government. But I didn't hear a lot of talk of what would happen if the government fired first. We really need to talk about that. Because if the government fires and we fire back, that's exactly what happened at Ruby Ridge, exactly what happened at Waco, and you saw how those turned out. That's not what we want. So, if, if the government fires first, there's no guarantee that the public will realize who fired first. And it will not prevent people from losing their lives. So, let's talk about this dilemma. Okay, let's, so we're always supposed to be concealed caring, but we can't harm a government agent. How do we do that? My general philosophy is that we need to provide incentives so that the government agent will not fire their weapon. As a general rule, and most people who carry weapons regularly understand this, you do not unholster your gun if, unless you're willing to use it. Because if you unholster your gun, even if you're facing a, a private criminal, they will see that as a lethal threat against them, and they're going to try their darndest to get a hold of it and fire it at you. So if you unholster a gun and you're not willing to fire it, you are likely to die. So that's one reason to not unholster your gun. Another reason is that a federal agent will, will shoot you. Because chances are the federal agent already has his weapon trained on you, pointed at your head. You try to unholster that gun, you're going to die. And how effective will you be at defending your family if you're dead? You should also not make any sudden gestures or movements that resemble a person unholstering a weapon. So you shouldn't dive with your hand into your jacket or in your purse and pull something out aggressively or a sniper may shoot you. <clears throat> now, of course, if the government does start attacking you and your supporters, you know, you're going to have to make sudden movements, but still you should avoid movements that could be interpreted as an unholstering of a weapon because that would make you a target. If a government agent shoots, the only person responsible for that shot is that specific government agent. When one government agent shoots, it does not give you justification to start shooting back at all the government agents because government is not a hive mind. It is a, it's just a bunch of individuals, each of whom is unique. In that sense, it's no different than any other group, and you must treat individuals according to their own actions, not according to the people they're standing next to, not according to the people who are wearing the same uniform. Now, the way we've been conditioned since birth is basically, oh, well, if one guy from group A attacks one guy from group B, that means everyone from group B can now kill everyone from group A. That's ridiculous. That's horrifying. That's how wars start, because one person is mad at another. We cannot continue to think this way. We as freedom lovers must think differently. 
think of groups in terms of each individual within the group and what they're responsible for. If nobody gets that initiation of force on video and you guys start firing back in self-defense, the public perspective will be that you are bloodthirsty terrorists and the government will now have a public license to commit genocide. You know, basically what I'm talking about is video cameras are crucial. If the government agent fires, you need to catch it on video. Every single person who carries a weapon needs to have a video and audio recording device mounted on their body continuously recording. And the way you do that is to have some kind of app or device that, that records in a loop. So it keeps recording over the same 20 minutes. And when you want to keep the last 20 minutes, you just hit a button and it keeps it. It saves it or streams or uploads it or whatever. Now... This is very, very important because when you are carrying a weapon, you have the potential of using that weapon. And if you do, you have to have evidence to back up your story. Otherwise, you can be seen as the violent criminal and you can go to prison for a very long time. Very important. And it's also important to distinguish in a standoff between government aggressors and peaceful protesters who initiated aggression. Now, let me tell you about another scenario. If one government agent fires and kills one of our members, the person killed did not unholster a weapon or make any sudden movements, and we do not fire a shot back in defense, and it's all caught on video, guess what? We've won. This would show without a doubt that we have self-control and the government does not. We are the good guys. They are the bad guys. As a result of this sequence of events, hundreds of thousands of people would join our movement. That is powerful. That's a thousand times more powerful than shooting back. So remember that. You don't even want to shoot back if you can help it. Now, I want to talk about one more thing that's very taboo and controversial. But we have to think outside the, outside the box, folks. We are trying to provide incentive for the government agents to not fire their weapon. Okay? For one, we're not going to unholster our gun. Two, we're not going to make any sudden movements. Three, we're, we're going to have video cameras and s stream that footage live to the internet. Four, we're not going to commit any violence to anyone who doesn't deserve it. Okay? Five. Let's say a private criminal invades my home <clears throat> and threatens my family's life. In that case, the public sees me as justified in using lethal force to defend my family. Reality is seen by the public. I'm the good guy. The home invader is the bad guy. Now, if you replace that private home invader with a government agent, the whole situation is flipped. The public is under the delusion that if a government agent invades my home, then I must have done something to deserve it. I'm the bad guy. The government aggressor is the good guy. We need to overcome this public delusion. And the only way to overcome it is to show the public reality. What's the reality? The government doesn't just harm a man if he kills him or throws him in jail. When the government commits aggression against a man, he is harming that man's entire family. He's tearing that father's family apart. He's forcing his children to grow up without the parent who loves them. He's severely limiting that family's ability to put food on the table because in today's society, both parents often are the breadwinners. You put one of them in jail, you're cutting their income in half and making it twice as hard for them to survive. You're also making it more difficult for that family to defend itself against violent crime. And this is really sad. I really encourage and I wish that every mature woman would carry a weapon with real stopping power. Unfortunately, there's a lot of families in which the father is the only one who's willing to do that. So if you put that man in, in jail, there's no one left to effectively defend that family. 
And as a result of putting that man in jail, members of that family could be tortured and murdered. Does anyone see that when they see someone carted off to jail? Oh, look at that prisoner. Look at his mugshot. Oh, what a bad looking guy. Nobody thinks of his family. The public doesn't see this. The only way they will is if we show it to them. We need to show the public who the government is really threatening. Here's how we do it. We don't, I'm just going to say it, we go to a protest like we're going to a family festival or a company picnic. We go with our families. We interact like we normally do, like we're at a barbecue. Hell, let's make it a barbecue. <laughs> okay, Let's have families get together, having fun, exercising their freedom of speech, having a good time, eating some food. Oh, by the way, we're taking our cattle back. Okay. Meanwhile, while we're having a good time showing the public with our video cameras who we really are, that we're normal, just like everyone else, meanwhile, the government agents are over there in their commando outfits with their megaphones hiding behind their cars with their assault rifles saying, we have a court order to shoot you. I mean, how ridiculous would they look? How obvious would reality be in that situation? I'm not talking about putting women or children at the front and having them shot. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about showing the world the kind of people we are. We're families like everyone else. Getting it all on video, just hanging out like we normally do so the government can look like the clowns that they are. Someone described this as, you know, a similar strategy to using human shields. They would, they would describe this as being cowardly. You know, men are, the one who are, uh, men are the ones who are supposed to stand up by themselves, leave their families at home, sacrifice themselves like a bunch of martyrs. Is it cowardly to behave normally, to be yourself? Is it cowardly to provide incentive for the federal government to not use violence? Is that cowardly or is it just using my brain? What's cowardly about saying what I really think? What's cowardly about facing the reality of the public delusion that exists and coming up with ideas for defeating it? I suppose the government would prefer we conceal our families at home, have all the men stand on a hilltop to be vilified by government-controlled media. Then we can all just rush down into the valley and be slaughtered like the old days of war. Is that courageous? or incredibly stupid and a recipe for failure. What if government agents started firing anyway? Really? Any government agent who shot a gun at a crowd of peaceful families on video would have to be crazier than any mass shooter I've ever read about. Let's cover the disincentives. Number one, unlike most situations, the government agents who follow orders can now see and feel the effects of their aggression firsthand. They can see the families that they are going to harm if they use violence. It's no longer hidden from, hidden from them. Plus, it's all on video, broadcasted to the world. And we're not dealing with gun -free, a gun-free zone where most mass shootings occur. We're talking about people who conceal carry, potential victims that can shoot back, and we're not hiding in a bunker or in a cabin off in the woods. We're showing the world who we really are so the government cannot control our image in the media. They cannot make us look like horrible monsters in the public eye. The chances of a government agent firing into a crowd of people, families having a good time, acting as if they're at a family festival, the chances are infinitesimal in my opinion. It's much more likely that a government agent will try to isolate and arrest individuals. You know, they're much more likely to use tasers or pepper sprays or attack dogs. Now, for those situations, those are manageable. We can remain peaceful in that situation. There are defensive strategies that do not involve harm to federal agents that can protect us from those kinds of actions. And I, want, I just want to commend Ammon Bundy and his fellow protesters at Bundy Ranch. Ammon Bundy 
in this video footage when they were pulling out this dump truck in the, in the backhoe and, and the uh, Bundys wanted to know if their cattle were being slaughtered and thrown in the dumpster. They blocked um, the path of these vehicles. And Ammon Bundy, oh, actually, Cliven Bundy's sister was thrown to the ground by a federal agent. So then Ammon Bundy was protesting it, yelling at the federal agents. And he was attacked twice by an attack dog. And he was tased, or tasered, whatever the proper term is, three times. The supporters around him prevented him from falling. They ripped the electric probes out of his skin so he could remain standing. Everyone stayed on their feet. Everyone was mobile. They were moving in and out. They defended each other without causing any harm to any human federal agent. It was, it was like watching a, a, gold medal, a gold medal Olympic performance. It was incredible. And you compare that to what you see at some of the Occupy Wall Street protests or other protests where the people are sitting Okay, they're locking arms, so it's diff more difficult to pick them up. But you get enough federal agents, and it's easy for them. They just overpower them. They just strip them away from each other. It's like, it's like picking berries. It's way easier for the federal agents to isolate people and arrest them. But the way the, peop the protesters were, the strategies the protesters were using at Bundy Ranch were much more effective at defending themselves from arrest and imprisonment and isolation. So I'm going to talk more about that, more about self-defense against government agents and how to move as a group and how to protect each other. But uh, let's keep moving here. We do have to cover the possibility, even though the chances are infinitesimal, in my opinion, if you follow all this advice that I've gone over. What if someone, a federal agent shoots at peaceful people in the crowd? Well, ideally... You do not want to shoot back. You want the other government agents to stop him. As I described, it would be absolutely insane for a federal agent to shoot a bullet into a crowd of families that are acting peacefully and having a good time and acting normally. And the government agents, the other government agents, are probably not going to be stupid enough to join that assault. At least I'd hope so. It's, it's not in their best interest to be viewed as people who commit genocide, people who slaughter families. Most of them are aware of that. So it's not, it's not impossible to imagine other government agents stopping that government agent who starts firing if we don't fire back. If we do fire back, all hell will break loose and the government agents will be firing against us. If we don't fire back, it's much more likely that the government agents will fire at the initial agent who initiated the lethal force. Okay, remember, there are snipers involved in most of these situations. So if you draw your weapon in the open, you are likely to be killed by a sniper, which makes you useless to defend your family in that situation. My personal advice, what I'd personally do is I'd help my family take cover first. Once they're behind cover, and once I find cover from snipers, if the government has failed to stop the government agent that initiated the, shoot, the shooting, if I could identify the individual responsible, and as long as I had a clear shot that did not endanger any innocent casualties, and as long as it is all captured on video and audio, then I'd stop them. To achieve freedom, we must shield ourselves from aggression, including government aggression. Attempting to do that in today's culture can be extremely dangerous. Personally, my goal is not to start a fight with federal agents. I support the strategy, the Sun Tzu strategy, of avoid strength and target weakness. The federal government has massive funding because they can tax hundreds of millions of people. Why walk up to the largest giant and slap him in the face, especially before you've gained experience defeating much less formidable opponents? I don't think it makes sense. 
to start a conflict with the federal government. My preferred sequence of events would be to start with weaker targets. First, master the art of protecting yourself against local private criminals. The next thing I do is figure out how to deal with the local aggressors within your local government. How do you get them to leave town using peaceful methods, public ostracism, etc.? Then, after I accomplish that, I would replace all local government services one at a time, or as many as at a time as I could handle, with voluntary alternatives. Once you replace all the local government services with voluntary alternatives, you no longer have a local government. And I suppose I do the same with a county government. You know, governments that are intimately involved in our lives and that are small enough in scale that we can manage the threats they pose. Now, once a free society is strong enough locally, individuals can voluntarily just stop complying with state and federal laws. I see no need to commit a blatant public act of defiance against state or federal government. Doing so provides unnecessary incentive for the state and federal government to attack you. We don't want them to attack us. We don't want to have to defend ourselves with force because we do not want to harm a federal agent because it results in tragedy. We want to avoid that scenario. How do you do that? The way I just described. Now, if we achieve that strength as a free society and individually we start opting out, we stop complying with the state and federal laws, at that point, if a state or federal government decides to target individuals among us, if they invade our neighborhood, then we can do what the bunnies did. Only we'll have larger numbers, more experience, and better strategies. Government aggressors won't stand a chance if we adhere to all these strategies that I propose. At least that's what I believe. I mean, that's why I'm presenting them. If you disagree, let me know. If there's anything wrong with what I've said, let me know. I want to know. I love it when I, when I understand and have those eureka moments where I'm like, oh, boy, was I wrong. Now I understand it better. So please help me in that effort. But uh, that's my general strategy. <clears throat> so let's just review. One, do everything you can to avoid harming a government agent. Two, achieve a larger number of local supporters than the number of potential aggressors beforehand. Three, always be recording in a way that prevents confiscation. Many cameras, many distances, many angles, streaming live to the internet, continuously recording in a loop. Four, always be carrying weapons, concealed. Five, protest in the open where others can easily see you and where the government aggressors cannot isolate you from the public. Six, do anything you can to show the public who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. Seven, critical thinking. Do not blindly follow anyone. Eight, never stop communicating your perspective to the public and to government agents. I don't mean telling government agent aggressors your secrets, you know, giving away your concealed exit routes or things like that. I'm talking about letting them know that you are taking on casualties. So those in charge who want to avoid tragedies like that can realize it and understand why you are not coming out, why you're not giving up and surrendering. Nine, have a backup plan for everything. Message of the day, incentives are everything. The more incentive we give government to not commit aggression against us, the more we can prevent violence from occurring. And nonviolence is a wonderful thing. That concludes this episode and the third and final part of this little series within the podcast. If you haven't checked out the last episode, part two, where I discussed 12 lessons on how to achieve freedom and avoid tragedy based on comparisons between Ruby Ridge, Waco, and the Bundy Ranch standoff. I think you'll find that interesting, especially if you found this interesting. So check that out. The next episode, I will be discussing more strategies for achieving freedom. Hope you'll join me. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it more than you could possibly know. Without you guys, this wouldn't be possible and it would be pointless. 
So I really appreciate it that you're listening. If you enjoyed the episode, you can rate it and review it on iTunes. That would help out and feel free to share it with friends. The more we share what we learn with each other, I believe the more effectively and the more swiftly we can collaborate to achieve freedom. So I hope you'll join me in that effort. If you want to leave a comment on this particular episode, go to howtoachievefreedom.com slash episode six. And I also strongly encourage you to connect with me. I'm on Google Plus a lot. I'm also on Facebook and Twitter, but I, but Google Plus is kind of my social network of choice. So if you go there and you search for Dan Shielding, you should find me. And I really look forward to connecting with you. Here's your action step. Always conceal carry to reduce violence. This is an obvious no-brainer. If you're not doing this, imagine what it would be like tomorrow if you're unfortunate enough to become the target of a violent criminal. If you lose your loved ones because you're not prepared, imagine what that would be like. I strongly encourage you to make this one of your top priorities if you haven't already. It's one of the most easy, effective ways to shield yourself from aggression and thus to achieve freedom. So there you go. Wishing you love, peace, freedom, and happiness. Can't wait to talk to you guys next time. Take care and have a wonderful week.